Thanks. So, we spent the last year, a lot of it, arguing about whether or not the internet is good or bad for democracy. And I think it's a fruitless debate. After all, we can all name ways in which it's good for democracy. We can rattle off instances of great civic engagement and voter mobilization, fundraising, good RFCs, and so on. Uh, and we can also rattle off ways in which it's been terrible for democracy. We can talk about echo chambers for vaccine and climate deniers, mineable social graphs that are the best friend a secret policeman ever had, platforms for invidious false flag operations such as the China's 50 cent army or our homegrown version, the persona management technology the Air Force has put out to tender. I think it's much more useful to ask ourselves which technologies are good for democracy. That is, which technologies change the balance in places where people with little power are trying to influence, hold accountable, or remove people with a lot of power? And how do we get more of those? And how do we stop those from being undone? And in that respect, I think that we can unequivocally say that we have two technologies that change the balance of power. The first of those are coordination tools. Uh, economists have known, at least since Coase's theory of the firm, that the secret sauce of any organization is how efficient it is at coordinating its efforts. Uh, but this has only become a, uh, apparent to people trying to change society when the net profoundly upended the job description of an activist. So I'm, as these things go, fairly uh, new to activism. I'm only 40. I was raised in, in activist circles, but of course activists have been around for a long time. But even so, I can remember when 98% of the job description of an activist was stuffing envelopes and 2% was deciding what to put in the envelopes. Right? It's almost inconceivable today to remember what it used to be like before we had the network. It's a little like, I once went spelunking through a bunch of old uh, consumer products ads, and you get these ads for the Wash Day Marvel. Goodbye Wash Day, hello Wash Day Marvel, goodbye Blue Mondays. These were the, the advent of the washing machine. And what you realize as you flip through ad after ad after ad is that there was a time in living memory when half of our species spent something like 60% of their waking hours washing clothes, right? We lose track of how incredibly revolutionary it is to take drudge work and automate it and what it means in terms of the cognitive surplus, everybody have a drink, and what it means in terms of the labor surplus, of being able to do more. <laughs> Coordination tools, after all, let us be superhuman. That is to say, there's only so much that one human being can do, but if we can coordinate with another human being, we can do more than one person can do. We can be superhuman. And so when you lower coordination costs, you radically change what people can do together because you can remove the tithe that we all pay to Ronald Coase and you can apply that labor that we, used to, that we used to squander on coordination to useful stuff. And we can make encyclopedias and operating systems and other things in the way that you know, we used to think of as either being the domain of enormous, well-coordinated organizations or bizarre, hive-like organizations. You know, we, 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 encyclopedias like ants make hills. But it's important to consider more than whether or not a technology is working. It's, it's in fact, uh, very, very important to ask yourself how well any given technology will fail. So a car with marvelous acceleration and terrible brakes is not a good car. And in fact, the better your acceleration is, the better your brakes have to be. Some of the best coordination tools we have have the worst failure modes. So Facebook uh, is a secret policeman's best friend. Which brings me to the second technology that I think we can say unequivocally changes the game from how it was before we had contemporary technology in terms of how we relate to power. And that, of course, is crypto. Strong cryptography we think of today as boring plumbing, just the stuff that lets your bank do its thing. But it's only very recently, very, very recently, that average people had the capacity to use cheap or free equipment 
to make and keep secrets that states couldn't access, that police couldn't access without rubber hoses, without, without actually extracting them from people rather than steaming them out of envelopes. So the combination of strong cryptography and design for privacy and active proxying and open network devices, phones and computers, hold out the promise of systems that enable coordination without exposing their users. Now, it's unsurprising that no one's actually built this stuff yet. As we saw during the Arab Spring, most of the tools that we have are completely unsuited to this. Most of the tools that we have have never had these design considerations in hand. Um, although, of course, some cypherpunks decades ago were warning about the need for this sort of thing, average users, even those in repressive environments, didn't have a visceral appreciation of the risk that arose with their marvelous new coordination tools. And that's because, of course, they were activists who used technology and not technology activists. A, t a technology activist is someone who's interested in how technology will upend the relationship between power. An activist who uses technology is someone who's got something she wants to do and finds a tool that suits her purposes. And I think that what we found in the last six months or a year is a hope that technology activists and activists who use technology will have more cause to speak to each other and do stuff together. The need for fit-for-purpose tools is now apparent to a much larger group than we've ever had. And now we may have enough activists who use technology to discipline the complexity that technology activists love so much. Although it's worth asking at this point whether or not we can really call coordination tools and secrecy tools democratic. After all, coordination, coordination tools and secrecy tools uh, are available just as readily, if not more readily, to the people who are already powerful as they are to the people who have no power, who are trying to change the relationships in power. Um, coordinate, uh, powerful organizations, how, uh, I would say, have always had the power to organize themselves. That's what it means to be a powerful organization, is that you've already solved your coordination problems. And so what you get when you add Facebook or the tools like Facebook that allow you to coordinate efforts together to people who are already in power is an incremental shift. Now you, can, now you can run the state a little more efficiently. You can waste a little less energy on it. But that's not the case. That's not what happens for people who are trying to change things. For people who are trying to change things, it is not a change in degree. It's a change in kind. When you give those people the power to coordinate themselves, all of a sudden, you, you change the nature of what their organizations are and what they can be, as opposed to simply making them slightly more efficient at what they've done all along. Um, and likewise, when it comes to secrecy, all, WikiLeaks notwithstanding, the rich and powerful have always had the power to keep secrets to some extent, whereas the people who have no power have always been on the, the losing side of that game. Changing things so that the rich and the poor, the powerful and the powerless, have access to the same secrecy technology is massively game-changing for people who've never had power. And again, merely a change in degree for people who've always had power. Coordination tools won't solve all our problems, and crypto will always be vulnerable to spies, coercion, and so on. But nevertheless, these two, techno the, these two technologies unambiguously benefit the powerless more than they benefit the powerful. And it must be said at this point that they also help bad people. They help people who want to do bad stuff. Because by definition, as soon as you build a technology that allows, um, uh, that allows the oppressed to resist authority, you also build a technology that allows criminals to resist authority, that allows people doing bad stuff to resist uh, authority. And I would say that we will never build a technology that allows powerless people to take power that will not also allow criminals to get away with stuff. So how do we foster these technologies? Well, we have to start by limiting the harms that arise in respect of them. Stop efforts by copyright enforcers and law enforcement to build backdoors for covertly running programs or lawfully intercepting communications. It is no coincidence that in the last year, the major breaches we've had of, uh, of, of secrecy have come out of lawful interception backdoors. So when Greece's parliament discovers that all of its phone communications have been wiretapped by parties unknown, we find out that the, that the facility that have been used by those parties to wiretap those conversations are the lawful interception technologies that have been put in at the behest of, 
American law enforcement agencies who want to know that every switch can be remotely accessed uh, by law enforcement in order to find bad guys doing bad stuff. When Gmail finds that its email is being intercepted by parties unknown, we discover again that it's a lawful interception backdoor that's been exploited. We have to understand that laws like Protect IP and their related legislation legitimize and create markets for tools that censor and surveil the internet and lead to more and better tools to put down democratic uprisings. We need to start changing the way we frame our critique of things like digital rights management to include these harms that arise. So, for example, Nintendo has a new pocket game device called the 3DS. And the 3DS is a little game thing that shows things in 3D and it's got a camera and texting and so on. Um, it's, it's basically a mobile network terminal. And the 3DS does a couple of remarkable things. It um, tries to connect to networks even when you ask it not to. And when it finds a network connection, it tries to download new firmware even if you ask it not to. And when it downloads that new firmware, that new firmware checks to see whether the old firmware has been tampered with in a way that lets you play games that you haven't paid for. And if it discovers that you have, it renders your device inoperable. Now, we complain about that in a consumer rights framework. We say, well, it's a bad deal for people who bought devices to not be able to run games of their choosing and so on. What we need to do is start reframing that as not just a consumer rights question, but as a question about what it means when we start to build into the fabric of the information society tools to allow devices to be remotely updated, remotely surveilled, and remotely shut down. What it means for democratic uprisings when the devices in our pockets, in our hands, under our skin, in our bags are designed from the ground up to allow some person who has some legitimate need to understand what we're doing and stop it if we're doing the wrong thing, to sneak around behind our back, run code on our devices that we can't audit, run code on our devices that we can't even see, run processes that we object to, and stop processes that we're trying to run. Because that's not just a question about consumer rights. When you transpose that to contexts like uh, an Arab Spring, when you transpose that to contexts like um, people in Croatia uh, uh, raiding government databases and publishing evidence of corruption, and when you start to imagine what happens when all the devices that make that possible have back doors built into them to allow people who have the right incantation to oversee or interdict those technologies, then you start to see that the power of technology to change power relationships is contingent entirely on how forward we think about requests from copyright enforcers, from people worried about terrorists, from law enforcement and so on, uh, to build our devices to make their jobs easier. Thank you. Technology isn't inherently democratizing, nor is it inherently authoritarian, but it can be put to the service of either goal. And until we start explicitly asking, what will this policy, business, or law do to technology's overall liberating capacity, we will continue to abet dictators at the expense of liberators. Thank you.